Hey folks, Mahin, uh, This Bear Eats Fascists uh, on Twitter, or you can find me at thisbear.com. And I am reading for you today, chapter two, uh, Big Bill Haywood's autobiography. Uh, this was part of a small print run done by international publishers back in the 50s. Um, uh, this label doesn't exist anymore as far as I'm aware, and um, I have not been able to find a more recent print edition of this since the 1950s. So basically, as far as your local library is concerned or any radical bookseller is concerned, this book doesn't exist. It's very much public domain, and I uh, wanted to share it with you all because it's, it's just fascinating history and I think very relevant to modern struggles. Uh, chapter two, Miners, Cowboys, and Indians. Uh, Bill Haywood has gone off to join his uh, first job or to, to move to his first job as a miner at the age of 15. This was my first long journey. We passed through Ogden going around Great Salt Lake as the Luzon cutoff had not yet then been built. I was on the lookout for Corrine and Promontory as I knew that these places had at one time been the stomping ground of my father and uncle. Promontory, or Promontory, excuse me, was the station where the Golden Spike was driven when the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific railroads met from the east and west. The Iron Horse, as the Indians called the railroad, had overtaken the covered wagons and ox teams. For many miles after we left the lake, the lowland was covered with a crust of salt. Then we came to the sagebrush flats of Nevada, which seemed endless. As far as the eye could reach, there was nothing but the long stretches of the gray-green shrub. The stations were few and the towns were small. We passed Elko, Battle Mountain, and then the Humboldt River came into view on the right. On the morning of the second day, I arrived at Winnemucca, went to the hotel, and immediately after dinner took the poor horse stage for Rebel Creek. The stag line, or the stage line, excuse me, extended in those days to Fort McDermott, an army post. The stage was loaded with freight. I was the only passenger. Inside was a big buffalo coat and a buffalo robe. I thought there would be no chance to get cold. From Winnemucca past the toll house was a rough, uh, was a road through sand hills, which was built of sagebrush laid the width of a wagon track. When tramped down, it was for a short time serviceable, but the sands were ever shifting so that new roads were continually in the process of being built. We arrived at Cane Springs for supper. It was already dark and getting very cold. When we went to the station, the driver got a drink of whiskey. I felt warmer after a cup of hot coffee. After the horses had been changed for a new team, the driver said, we are ready, let's go. I piled into the coach. The buffalo robe and the coat were gone. They belonged to the driver. It was a cold, clear night. In front of us and a little to the right, we could see the majestic outline of Granite Peak, in the shelter of which the winter snows were stored, furnishing some water to the flats below. This was my first view of the Santa Rosa Range. When we reached Rebel Creek, it was late at night. I had been thinking about unrolling my blankets for a bed. I climbed down from the stage, cold and shivering, and found that supper had been prepared and a clean white bed was awaiting me. A spring wagon was provided, into which I threw my roll of blankets and my valise, and we drove to Eagle Canyon two miles up which the Ohio mine was located. There was not a tree in sight, nothing but the scrubby willows that grow along the little stream that flowed down the canyon. There was but one house. It was built of lumber and was about 28 feet long, 14 feet wide, divided in two by a partition. In the front room, bunks were ranged, double length and three high. In this room, there was no chairs, no tables, no furniture of any kind other than a desk and the stuff belonging to the men, consisting almost entirely of blankets and clothing and a few suitcases and bags thrown under the lower bunks. The second room had a big cook stove in the corner, a kitchen table and a cupboard along one wall. Along the other wall, where there was a window, was a long table running with brown flower patterned oilcloth, with benches running the full length on either side. Overhead on the beams were piled the groceries and other supplies in the bunk of the Chinese cook, which was reached by a ladder. Charlie Singh was a good cook and kept his part of the house scrupulously clean. The other room was also clean as far as being free from vermin was concerned, but the lumber was without paint and had never seen a plane. There was a little porch in front, a bench over which hung a looking glass, wash pans, a water bucket alongside the bench, and towels hung against the side of the house. The well was near the creek in the bottom of the gully. Below the house stood an old stone cabin, half dug out with logs, brush, and dirt for a roof. One corner of this was fixed up for use as an assay office. The rest was used for storing cases of canned foods, vegetables, and other supplies. My stepfather came down from the mine a few minutes ahead of the other men who were working there. He was glad to see me. After meeting the men and having dinner, I unrolled my blankets and spread them on some hay in the bunk over the desk. I put on my overalls and jumper and digging boots that same afternoon and went to work in the mine. My first job was wheeling rock from a shaft that was being sunk at the end of an open cut. I soon found that a wheelbarrow loaded with rock was more than I could handle. So I made the loads lighter and took more trips. I was glad enough when quitting time came. 
When we got down to the house, it was already dark. The usual mining camp was ready and everyone pitched in with a hearty appetite. It was but a few minutes afterward when the dishes were cleared away that the men gathering are gathered around the table again, reading, playing cards or chess as best they could by flickering candlelight. Others were stretched out in their bunks or sitting on the edges of them. And so the winter evenings were passed. There was no place to go. The closest town was Winnemucca, 60 miles away. There was one saloon at Willow Creek, the post office, four miles away, but this was seldom patronized, although occasionally some of the men would go to the station, or uh, who went to the station, brought back a couple of bodies, bottles of whiskey. And though miners situated as we were could not keep in close touch with current events, we were all great readers. I remember the second Christmas I was there, one of my relatives sent me a book on baseball. This would have been interesting enough some years before, but I was now in a place where one side of a baseball team couldn't be scratched up in a long day's ride. I did not have many books of my own, but the miners all had some. One had a volume of Darwin. Others had Voltaire, Shakespeare, Byron, Burns, and Milton. These poets were great favorites of my stepfather. We all exchanged books, and quite a valuable library could have been collected among these few men. Some received magazines, and there were four or five daily papers that came to the camp. They were all, or that they were a week old, made little difference to us. I should mention that uh, this was, of course, before the invention of radio or television, and so working class people read books for entertainment and talked about ideas and what that means for a working class movement and the self education of working class people uh, compared to now when we're all just consuming what the mass media gives us. Uh, it's pretty dramatic. And so uh, it's, it's common to think of the way television and radio and whatnot bring the world together, um, as the capitalists like to say, but a lot of people don't think about what we've lost. Anyway, moving on with the book. I had a friend about whom I have not yet spoken. This was Tim. He, which, he was much more than the ordinary dog one usually meets. A shepherd type, as large as a good-sized collie. His coat was black with brown points and a white patch at his throat. He was quick and strong and had limpid brown eyes. He did not speak my language, but I could understand his tail wagon, his joyful bark, fierce growl, pathetic whine, and low, peculiar croon. There was something about Tim that always made me think of him as a real person. It was though the personality of some lovable human had found a place in his being. Instinct was not the only attribute that actuated Tim, although perhaps for scientific reasons, I should not venture to assert that Tim could think. Anyway, you could now well enough, or you now know him well enough to understand the kind of companion such a dog can be to a boy at a mine 60 miles from a railroad with the nearest neighbor four miles away. The one boy in that section of the country I saw only occasionally, but Tim was with me all the time. He and I had heaps of fun. I helped him out in many a desperate fight we had with Lynx, Wildcat, and Badger. John Kane was the assayer and ore sorter at the mine. He took a great liking to me and taught me assaying. He was a big, heavy set, good natured Irishman with a heavy black mustache and pleasant eyes. When I went to work with him, I helped him prepare the samples that were to be assayed. No work I ever did in my life was as fascinating as assaying. These small first ventures into the realm of chemistry led me to feel that I would like to become a mining engineer. I made up my mind to learn this profession and wrote to the Houghton School of Mines and the Columbia School of Mines to learn their requirements for entrance. I secured some books on assaying and surveying and devoted much time to study, but I never entered either of these colleges. I found myself with other responsibilities and my further education was secured in the school of experience. I took a shotgun one day and started up the canyon looking for grouse or sage hen when I ran across a Basque sheep herder who suggested, maybe you want deer? I told him that would be fine. We went together to his camp on the ridge that divided Eagle Creek from Rebel Creek, where he got his rifle and we started around the summit towards a clamp of a clump of scraggly poplar trees. It was a thick undergrowth of manzanita. Pointing to a big flat rock on one side of the wood, he handed me his rifle and said, you go there, I stay here a few minutes. Then I go through, maybe deer come out. I walked over and climbed up to the flat rock from which I had a clear view of all that side of the woods. Presently, I heard the crash of undergrowth and outburst a beautiful big stag with splendid antlers. I stared at him amazed when he turned and bounded down the bed of the creek, heading into the brush again. In a short time, the Basque came plodding through the manzanita over to where I was sitting and asked me, did you see deer? I told him that I had and started to explain what a big bucket was. He interrupted me by saying, why you no shoot? Only then the thought struck me what a splendid shot I could have had at that buck. I tried to tell the Basque that I had forgotten to shoot, but he took his rifle and marched off without a word. I must have had an attack of the buck egg, that's in quotes. Um, if I had scared up the deer and left the Basque to do the shooting, we would have had venison for supper. One morning as I came out of the dry gulch on my way to the station, I saw a bunch of saddle horses and a crowd of men in front of Andy, Andy Kinniger's place at the mouth of Willow Creek. 
I hurried on and heard that Kinniger had been shot and the surgeon from Fort McDermott was trying to find the bullet. It was somewhere in the dead man's skull. I marveled at the skill with which the surgeon had removed the top of the skull to probe down the spinal column where the bullet had lodged. Kinniger had been shot sometime the previous evening while he was seated in a chair leaning back against a clump of willows. Later, it was proved that Kinniger was killed by old one-armed Jim, a Paiute Indian who was arrested, tried, and sentenced to hang. But no one could find any motive for the Indian's action, and everyone believed that he was at most an accessory. A petition was circulated, and the sentence of one-armed Jim was commuted to life imprisonment in the Carson Penitentiary. I saw him there many years afterward when I visited the pen to see Preston and Smith, who were serving life sentences. These were two miners from the Goldfield, whose stories I will tell later. I recall an interesting feature about the penitentiary yard, which had been made by excavating into the mountainside. A rough half circle was dug out, leaving sheer walls and places 60 to 80 feet high. On the floor of the yard were the imprints of what must have been an elephant or mastodon at prehistoric times, and also the footprints of a man which were half again as large as an ordinary man's footprints. These impressions were made in mud, apparently, but were hardened to solid rock. Involuntarily, one followed the footprints as they led to the wall. There, one half of the animal's track was left exposed. The other half was covered by 80 feet of solid rock and alluvial soil. One realized that it was just a little too late. The animal had passed by perhaps 200,000 years before. The wall of time had arisen to prevent our following. People were sociable in the frontier country. <clears throat> A dance was quite an event. It would be planned some weeks ahead, and people would gather from 30 to 40 miles around. It was not unusual for some of the ranchers with their families to drive 40 miles to a dance, dance all night and then all day the next day, and then drive home. As for dancing partners, well, there were girls and old women from the ranches, and sometimes Indian squaws would take part. Um, note, I'm going to use terms like squaw and negro, which I didn't use in the first chapter because they're contemporary and they're part of the book, and... Um, whatever I may think about that and how the language has changed in this century since he wrote this. It's part of the original text and um, I don't wanna whitewash anything. Moving on. At an impromptu dance at Kinniger's place, Mrs. Snap from the station at Rebel Creek played the dance music on a three stringed fiddle accompanied by Tom Melody who had contrived a tambourine by putting beans in an empty cigar box. But more interesting were the Indian dances where in a circle cleared on the sagebrush flat, the Indians would gather for their powwow and dance, sometimes the snake dance, the ghost dance, the sun dance, or some other just as mysterious. Their only music were the drums and the lilt of the squaws. The tunes were plaintive and fantastic and sounded much alike to me. In the night when the fires were lighted, the hypnotic rhythm of the drums and the low springy furtive dance steps of the Indians accompanied by the low crooning song were thrilling. The story of the massacre of the Paiute Indians at Thacker Pass was told to me first by Jim Sackett, one of the volunteers who took part in the killing. I also heard the story from Ox Sam, a Paiute who made his escape, one of only three survivors. I first heard this hair-raising narrative when old Sackett happened to be a chance visitor at the Ohio mine. It began with an explanation of the many depredations on the part of the Indians throughout Southern Oregon and Northern Nevada, which caused the white men to organize a volunteer company, which he said was for mutual protection. This company had been famous as the crack Indian fighters of that section. Their quarters were at Fort McDermott, and from this base, they scoured the country looking for Indians. McDermott was on the western slope of the Santa Rosa Range in the mouth of a branch of the Quinn River. Sackett was an old pensioner who roamed about the country doing little, as he was then too old to work much. There were only a few of his type left. He was at home in the mountains and in the cabins of the prospectors or at the ranges along the river in the valley. He wore his hair and his beard long, beard long, both grizzled gray. His eyes were weak and looked as though they were sore from alkali dust. As he talked, he would squirt tobacco juice at an object he had located as a target and hit it with remarkable precision. His story started. Trigger warning here, of course, he's about to describe uh, a massacre against unarmed people. Um, that day we had camped, and this is a quote from the uh, um, old Indian fighter uh, Sackett who he met and uh, yeah. Uh, that day we had camped at the mouth of Willow Creek, just above where Andy Kenninger's house stands now. We were setting down for a good night's sleep when the call came for boots and saddles. Now what's up? The outfit was ready to move in a very short time, mules packed and horses saddled. The captain coming up pointed across the valley in the direction of what is now called Thacker Pass saying, if you look close, you can see a fire there. Before dusk, I thought I would see smoke, but now I see the fire. It is an Indian camp. We've got to get there by daylight. We'll start when it gets a little darker. It was a long ride across the sagebrush flat and through the meadows as we got close to the river, which we had to swim. 
more meadows, and then the sagebrush again. One of the horses stepped into a badger hole and broke his leg. We couldn't kill him until the next day. They might have heard the shot, and we did not want to alarm them. Here the company divided. Part were sent to ride ahead down the pass to the camp. A small detachment was left with the extra pack animals and saddle horses. The rest of us rode up the pass. Daylight was just breaking when we came inside of the Indian camp. All were asleep. We unslung our carbines, loosened our six shooters, and walked into that camp of savages. And again, this is the person who's participating in a genocide describing people as savages. It's not Haywood's words. Um, at a gallop, shooting through their wickups as they came. In a second, sleepy eyed squaws and bucks and little children were darting about, dazed with their sudden onslaught, but they were shot down before they came to their waking senses. The other detachment came rushing in, but did no shooting until they were close up. From one wiki up to another, we went pouring in bullets. Then we dismounted to make a closer examination. In one wiki up, we found two little papooses still alive. One soldier said, make a cleanup, nits make lice. When Charlie Thacker spoke up saying, I'd like to keep these two if there ain't no serious objection. Before it was decided, someone sang out, there's one getting away. He was already a mile off on a big gray horse going like the wind. Some of us began to shoot. Several got on their horses and started after him, but it was too late. He escaped. They soon returned. Those of the Indians who were only wounded, we put out of their misery and then mounted and rode away. Colonel Charlie Thacker carrying his two papooses behind him. Uh, end of the quote. And this is Bill Haywood speaking again. He says, those children were grew to manhood and uh, were known as Jimmy and Charlie Thacker. When I knew them both, they had gone back to living with the Indians. They were fine stalwart men. As men, I imagine they were much better than those who had helped kill their fathers and mothers, relatives and friends. Um, so this is Bill Haywood at, uh, I think, 15 or 16 now saying, Old Sackett's tail seemed to pull a lot of the fringe off the buckskin clothes of the alluring Indian fighters I had read about in dime store novels. There was nothing I had ever read about with heart palpitating of killing women and little children while they were asleep. The old volunteers exploits were at a discount with me after that and declined even more when Ox Sam some months later told me in his pigeon English what had happened at Thacker Pass. He made no additions to the story, but it was the feeling in these things uh, he said that Sackett did not possess. The old Indian buck was one day sitting on a sack of charcoal at the door of his half dug out cabin, which he used as an assay office. I went out and sat beside him, asking him how his squaw Maggie and his papooses were. Well, pretty good, he answered. I said, Sam, tell me about Thacker Pass. He glanced up with a distant look in his eyes, murmuring, long time ago, no much talk about now. But I said, Sam, I would like to know why the white men kill Indians. Do you know? Sam's eyes narrowed. Yeah, I sabi. You know sabi? I told him I did not. Sam began. Long time ago, same time I born, maybe before, no white man stay in Nevada. That time Paiute lived pretty good. In spring, catch plenty fish, dry them, smoke them. Lots of duck, lots of goose, smoke them too. In the fall, kill the deer, jerk them meat. First time frost come, catch them plenty pine nut. All time lots of rabbit, lots of sage hen. Paiute no sabi big ranch, don't make them farm. All same live pretty good. Sometime Bannock, sometime Shoshone man steal Paiute squaw. We make them fight. Sometime Paiute steal Shoshone or Bannock squaw. Make them pretty good fight. Sometime make them big gamble, sometime big dance, sometime big powwow. Hot, cold, all the same. Paiute live. When him die, make up big pile rock, him stay inside. Got bow and arrow, good knife, kill him good pony. Paiute go to happy hunting ground, everything good. White man he come. He makes little farms, sometime marry Paiute squaw. That's pretty good. Mix some blood all same like Bannock and Shoshone. Pretty soon come more white man. Him prospector, him pretty good. I know Sabi all time, dig hole, make him big pile rock, dig more hole. He no stay long one place, soldier man come, no Sabi soldier. He no got him farm, he no dig him hole, he no do nothing, say all time Uncle Sam. He all live one house, no woman, I know Sabi. All time talk him squaw, squaw, he got fire water, give him Paiute. Make him crazy, all same white man. All Indians have big powwow. Big chief say, what matter now? Too much trouble all time. Indian like him fire water. Fire water he no good. Soldier give Indian fire water. No like fire water. Indians sell him mink skin, badger skin, all kind, of, all kind of skin to soldier. Sell him squaw too for fire water. By and by Indian he crazy. No more fire water. All same crazy. Chief say soldier not much good. Indians say all white men not much good. Pretty soon white man kill him Paiute. Indian no much sabi. He kill him white man. That's a pretty bad time. Soldier hunt Paiute, all same as coyote. That's time Thacker Pass. Lots of Indians going quin 
a river sink to get ducks goose that morning soldier come quick shoot shoot i cut wiki up skin behind go quick and get on big white horse ride fast soldier soldier no catch him no shoot him i ride disaster peak long time hide my father my mother my sisters my brothers i no see no more long time ago not much talk about now old sam ended with a tremor in his voice and moisture in his eyes yeah i saw me i saw me grasping his hand i said you stay a little while sam we'll be having dinner pretty soon There was a wide historical meaning in the brief story that Ox Sam, the pirate Indian, told me. This is again, uh, Bill Haywood speaking again. It began when the earliest settlers stole Manhattan Island. It continued across the continent. The ruling class with their glass beads, bad whiskey, Bibles, and rifles continued the massacre from Astor Place to Astoria. Halfway between the camp and the mouth of the canyon, there was a big ledge of quartz, the outcropping of which stood high cleaving the mountain from base to summit. Charlie Day, who was, the work, who was then working in the Ohio mine, had located this cropping, but said that he never intended to do the assessment work on it. When Knighty said, I'll give you Caledonia mine if you want it, with the thought of being a mine owner, I accepted from him the quick claim deed, to, which, uh, to make which binding I gave him the legally required sum of $1. I used to pass this claim with the idea of working it sometime, but having come into possession of it so cheaply, I ignored its possible value. Some years later, I worked in it as a miner after Dr. Hansen of Winnemucca had relocated it, organized a company and erected a quartz mill. I had neglected the assessment work and my right to it had long before expired. It came into the possession of the Caledonia Mining and Milling Company. When the first lot of ore was run through the mill, everyone was excited as to what the returns were going to be. We had heard different reports as to how the assays were running and that some nuggets had been caught in a battery of ore crasher. But we never knew the returns as a nephew of the doctor ran away with the entire output. And as far as I know, was never caught. After this episode, there was an air of discouragement and pessimism about the mine. The men did not know whether they were going to get their pay or not, and shortly afterwards, I quit. Coming down the trail from the mine one day, John Kane and I were skylarking, and I jumped on his back. He fell and broke his leg. The other man helped carry him down to the bunkhouse. I started off to Rebel Creek to get a team and spring wagon to take John to the hospital at Fort McDermott. We put a mattress in the wagon, got John in, and started on a 30-mile drive to the surgeon. It must have been a painful trip for him, but the surgeon did a good job, and six weeks later, John was back at work. That is, he was working in the assay office, hobbling about on a crutch. Men situated as we were sometimes form close friendships. This was true of Pat Reynolds and myself. Pat was the oldest man in the job, tall, raw-boned, with a thin, or with a red chin whisker, bushy eyebrows, and a strawberry mark on the outer corner of his left eye. It was this old Irishman that gave me my first lessons in unionism. Pat was a member of the Knights of Labor, and some of the things he told me about this organization I could not well understand at the time. I had never heard of the need of working men organizing for mutual protection. In that part of the country, there did not seem to be a wide division between the boss and the men. The old man who was the boss slept in the same room and ate at the same table and appeared, at the same, appeared the same as the rest of the men. But Pat explained that he was not the real boss, that none of us knew the actual owner of the mine. Mentioning the large ranches in the vicinity, he said the owners live in California, while the men do all the work, or who do all the work and make all the ranches and mines of value are here in Nevada. He told me about the unions he had belonged to, the Miners Union in Bodie, California, and the Virginia City Miners Union in Nevada, organized in 1867, the first miners union in America. These two unions were among the first that formed the Western Federation of Miners. It was some time before I got the full significance of a remark that he made, that if the working class was to be emancipated, the workers themselves must accomplish it. Early in May, 1886, this thought was driven more deeply into my mind by reading in the newspaper the details of the Haymarket riot, and later the speeches that were made by the men who were put to trial. And the facts and details I talked over every day with Pat Reynolds, I was trying to fathom in my own mind the reason for the explosion. Were the strikers responsible for it? Was it the men who were their spokesmen? Why were the policemen even in Haymarket Square? Who threw the bomb? It wasn't Albert Parsons or anyone that he knew. If it had been, why did Albert Parsons walk into court and surrender himself? Who were those who were so anxious to hang these men they called anarchists? Were they of the same capitalist class that Pat Reynolds was always talking to me about? The last words of August spies kept running through my mind. Quote, there will come a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you are strangling today. End quote. It was a turning point in my life. 
I told Pat that I would like to join the Knights of Labor. From this time, although there was never an opportunity to join, I was a member in the making. Soon after this, I made my first visit home since I had begun to work in the mine. After a few weeks, I returned to Nevada. The next year was a year of financial crisis, and panics of this kind affect the miner as well as the workers in other industries. The Ohio mine was closed down, and I was left in charge. I lived alone at the camp with my dogs for company, and I did my own cooking. Some time later, I returned to Utah, and I went to work in the Brooklyn mine. My first job there was filing the boilers and running the top car, taking away the waste and ore that were sent to the surface. The Brooklyn was an inclined shaft 1,400 feet deep in which there was a skip that was hauled up by the engine for which I was firing the boilers. For a while, I worked in what was called the Mormon Stope. It had been given this name because several of the men employed there were from the San Pete Valley, a strictly Mormon section. I worked in several different places in this mine, which was producing lead. There were men going to and coming from the hospital all the time, suffering from lead poisoning. This is one of the serious vocational diseases with which the workers have to contend, but there was no provision made for them. In that part of the country, the miners were sent to hospitals in Salt Lake City, which they themselves maintained. Every miner had $1 a month taken out of his wages by the company for hospital services. Their transportation to and from the hospital, the workers had to pay themselves. A crowd of lead miners presents a ghastly appearance as their faces are ashen pale. Now, there are many dangers to which a miner is exposed besides rheumatism, consumption, lead poisoning, and other diseases. One of these is the constant danger of falling rocks when a mine is not kept closely timbered. I was working but a short distance from Louis Fontaine when he was killed by a slab of rock from the roof, crushed his head right onto the drill that he was holding. We got the body out of the stope on a timber truck, ran it up to the station, and put all that was left of Louis in the skip. We rang three bells for the surface. Some of us laid off to go to the funeral. The men rode on the skip, coming up to dinner at quitting time. Four could sit in the skip on either side, two on the crossbow, and one on the angle to which the steel cable was fastened. One day I got on the cable behind the man on the angle and rode it all the way to the top. It was one of the most hair-raising experiences of my life. The cable was whipping the timbers at the top and the rafters on which the skip ran up the steep incline. I was afraid every second that my hands would be caught as I held onto the cable behind my head and I gripped the man in front of me with both legs to keep from turning on the rope. While at the Brooklyn mine, I sent to Nevada for my sweetheart, Nevada Jane Miner. We were married and went to live in Salt Lake City where our first child was born a boy who died at birth. Shortly afterwards, we returned to Nevada where I spent some time doing assessment work for Thad Hoppin and prospecting. I later went to work on the Hoppin Ranch. A cowboy's life is not the joyous, adventurous existence shown in the moving pictures, read about in cheap novels or to be seen in world exhibitions. The cowboy's work begins at daybreak. If he is on the ranch, he rolls out of bed, slips on his pants, boots, and hat and goes to the barn to feed the saddle horses. It is, his, it is his greatest pride that he does not work on foot. Coming back, he washes his face and hands at the pump and takes his place at the long table. The Chinese cook brings in piles of beef steaks, potatoes, hotcakes, and long butter, as the flour gravy is called, because on the big cattle ranch where there are thousands of cows, oftentimes there will not be one milk cow and no butter but what is hauled in many miles from the town to the ranch. And there are various kinds of work for the cowboy to do during the different seasons on a cow ranch. The cattle are not pastured or herded, but run wild on the mountains and sagebrush flats. They are rounded up in the spring and fall, the roundup being called the rodeo. This and other words commonly used in the Southwest come down to us from the days when this part of the country was a Spanish colony, and Spanish was the usual language. The foreman, who was called the major domo of the biggest ranch in the neighborhood, issued the call for the rodeos. Cowboys from all the ranches in a radius of 100 miles or more came with their saddle um, horses, each bringing three or four. And I lost my place. Each bring in three or four. The bedding consisted of a couple of blankets and a bed canvas. When traveling with the rodeo, the men rolled up their bedding and put it in the chuck wagon, which also carried the cooking utensils and the grub. Starting from the home ranch, the outfit would camp on the banks of a stream or near the spring and sometimes would be compelled to make a dry camp, in which case they hauled along barrels of water for the emergency. After supper, we stretched our beds on the ground, gambled and otherwise amused ourselves, telling stories of past experience and singing lilting and rollicking songs. A horse wrangler or two guarded the paratha, the herd of saddle horses. We all went to sleep as soon as night fell. At the first break of day, the cook was up getting breakfast. The wranglers brought the horses. The cowboys went to the corral. Each roped his horse out of the band, saddled and bridled it, and we went to the chuck wagon for breakfast. 
After eating, we rolled cigarettes, mounted our horses, and started for the mountains, some going up one canyon, some up another. We rode to the highest summits. Turning, we drove before us all the cattle on that part of the ranch. The roundup took place in the valley below where the cattle were brought together. The cowboys formed a circle around them, 50 or 100 cowboys spaced out several, around several hundred head of cattle. Two or four cowboys from the biggest ranch rode among the herd and drove out the cows and young calves. They were able to recognize their own by the brands and earmarks on the cows. The task was then for the cowboys from each ranch to brand and earmark the calves that belonged to the ranch they were working for. The party now continued until all the cows and young calves were separated from the herd. The other cattle were started back to the mountains. Two or three small fires were lit in the corral and the first bunch of cows was driven in. The other bunches were held to await their turn. We roped the calves by the hind legs and dragged them out near the fire by taking a turn with the rope around the horns of our saddles. We cut the ears of the calves with their own peculiar marks, crop, underbit, swallow fork, and other designs. The brand of the ranch was burned into hip or shoulder. This proceeded until all the calves were branded and earmarked, the males gelded, leaving one out of every 25 or 50 for breeding purposes and selecting those which in the opinion of the cowboys would make big strong animals. Outside of the bawling and the bellowing of the calves and cows, there was silence. We had little to say while at work as we were nearly choked with dust. Meanwhile, the chuck wagon had moved on to the next camping ground. If the horses had not had a hard day's work, we would start for supper at a long swinging lope, singing ribald songs at the top of our voices. Unsaddling the horses where we were going to make our beds for the night, we washed up and were ready with ravenous appetites for grub. The day's work was done. The roundup took several weeks. We went up one side of the valley and down the other side. Another roundup took place every fall when beef steers were gathered for the market. It was carried on in much the same way that we used to take more care not to drive animals fast because of the weight that would be lost from marketable steers. When beef was needed for the camp, a young heifer or steer was killed. The cowboys, as a rule, used to barbecue the head and other parts of the animal. This was done by heating rocks which were put into a hole that had been prepared, the head and pieces of meat being wrapped in pieces of wet canvas, put on top of the hot rocks and covered in dirt. In the mornings, we would dig it out, remove the canvas and the hide, and with a little pepper and salt, the main part of our breakfast was ready. Wild horses are more fleet-footed than cattle, more difficult to handle. After the roundup of horses, those that were wanted for harness and saddle were kept in field or corral until the slack season of fall and winter, when they were broken to work or ride. This was the most exhilarating part of a cowboy's life. There was much excitement in riding wild horses, as well as in handling them, not only for the rider, but for the onlookers. Some horses were extremely vicious, biting, striking, and kicking fiercely to say nothing of their bucking propensities. I'm gonna ride that roan colt today, said Tom Miner, my brother-in-law, as, we as we were rolling out of bed in the bunkhouse of Hoppins Ranch. I bet he'll pitch some, remarked John White. Oh, I don't know, said Tom. I think he'll be as easy as a rocking chair. After breakfast, six or eight cowboys went out to the corral. It was a bright, sparkling morning. The air was clean with a light frost. John White had a lasso on his arm and moved towards the horses, saying, I had her full of ginger this morning, Tom, as he threw his rope around the neck of a rangy roan colt and sat back on the rope. Two of the boys ran up to help him, and Miner started towards the horse, his hand slipping along the taut lasso. Whoa, rocking chair, he purred, reaching out his hand to the colt, which was used neither to his new name nor to the smell of human beings. The horse reared and struck out with both forefeet. After repeated efforts and much stroking, a halter was finally slipped over its head, and a leather blindfold was pulled down over its eyes. The lasso was taken off, and the colt stood quivering at every nerve. Tom kept murmuring, whoa, rocking chair. With sideways and forward motions, they got the horse near the fence and tied him to a post. Tom tossed a blanket on him, but he kicked, snorted, and bucked until he got it off. This was repeated until the colt came to the conclusion that he was not being hurt. He was led out to the open field, where with much careful persuasion, he was hackamored and saddled. Miner, fastening on his big rowdy spurs with a quirt on his right wrist and reins in the left hand, which was on the horn of the saddle, placed his left foot in the stirrup and was on. He reached over and pulled up the blindfold, hit the colt on the shoulder with his quirt, and rock and chair began to buck, all four feet bunched his head down between his forelegs, his back bulged up like a camel's hump, while Miner was gouging him with his spurs and whipping him with his quirt. White sang out, lovely Jesus, but can't he buck, some rocking chair. The horse twisted, corkscrewed, cavorted, and did everything a horse could do except roll. When he was completely exhausted, Tom rode him back to the corral and got down. 
Then one of the boys took rock and chair and unsaddled him. Miner said to the group who'd come to shake hands with him, he's a tough gazebo. We'll save him for the Pendleton roundup. The cowboys and miners of the West led dreary and lonesome lives. They had drifted westward from points of civilization, losing contact with social life. Young and vigorous, they were bursting with enthusiasm, which occasionally broke out in wild drinking sprees and shooting scrapes. They were deprived of the friendship of women, as the country was not yet settled. And when they visited the small towns on the railroad, they gave vent to their exuberant feelings. We saw dust coming up the valley one day and wondered who it might be. Looking again a little later, we could see a sorrel team in a light buggy, but we did not recognize the occupant even when we pulled into the yard. We went out and asked him to in asked him to unhitch and have supper with us. He told us that his name was Henry Miller. We had never seen him before, but knew him as one of the biggest ranch owners of the West. Putting his team in the barn after watering the horses and giving them a feed of hay, we took Miller to the house and seated him in the kitchen while we set about preparing supper. One of us, and there were only two men at the ranch at that time, reached up and took down a package of coffee from the shelf when Miller broke in. Now I see why Hopkin goes broke. He feeds the ranch hands Arbuckle's coffee. No wonder he goes broke. I would go broke too if I give my men Arbuckle's coffee. We did not comment on this outburst as the coffee seemed cheap enough to us. In the course of the evening, Henry Miller told us how he made his tremendous fortune. He said, I starts with mit a I starts out mit a basket of meat on me arm. I peddles it from house to house. I make me not one fortune, but tree fortunes. I make one fortune for Lux, one for de goddamn lawyers and thieves, and one for myself. If it was not for de goddamn lawyers and thieves, I own now the whole damn state of California. Anyhow, I got it some land. I can travel from mine wheat ranch in Modesto to de White Horse Ranch in Oregon, mid a team, and stop on my own land every night. Lux was his business partner. Miller and Lux was a powerful firm of meat raisers and wheat growers in California, which exploited the state in the early days. We were always busy on the Hoppin' Ranch. According to the season, sheep shearing, breaking horses, handling the cattle, or haying kept us on the go. There were three hay ranches, one alone of which was 3,000 acres. At this time, Fort McDermott was abandoned by the army. There was no industrial center anywhere near, and the Indians were practically all killed. My father, excuse me, he says exterminated. The Indians were practically all exterminated. My father-in-law was appointed custodian of the government property. My wife and I went to live alone at the old deserted army post until the family could arrange to move there from Willow Creek. That is the end of chapter two. Hope that you have enjoyed this chapter. Again, this is Bill Haywood, uh, who went on to be a critical figure in the American labor movement and the socialist movement, um, describing his early life growing up um, first in Utah and then moving on to be a miner um, and brief, briefly a ranch hand. Um, and in chapter three, which is coming up next, we'll get a little bit more into his early time uh, organizing and becoming more radical. I hope you come back. Uh, in the meantime, like, subscribe, all of that sort of stuff. And let me know that you appreciate the video. Cheers.